church is that God cares about lost people and wants them found. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So everything in this world ultimately belongs to God. Everything, every cow, cat, cheetah, chipmunk, chihuahua, every animal, every piece of gold, silver, diamond, bitcoin, whatever that is, and any other kind of wealth, it all belongs to God. Everything we see here, All of this belongs to God. There's only one thing that belongs to God that in Scripture he calls lost, and that is people who don't know Christ. God loves lost people, and he wants us to reach them. So this morning we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, a very familiar passage. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus was being criticized for hanging out with rotten people. People who would rip you off and then laugh in your face. People who would not allow their shadow to darken the door of a church. Verse 1 tells us the tax collectors were gathering to hear Jesus. Now, none of us wants to get a call from the IRS, but my guess is we don't consider their employees to be evil or bad. Well, I mean, if you've had an audit, you might. But in Christ's times, tax collectors were extortion artists. The Roman government gave them an amount of money they needed to raise, and anything they could raise beyond that was theirs. And so this led to people really trying to rob others, taking more than was their right, and legally doing it. On top of that, the Jews hated them because they worked for the hated Roman government. Those who were oppressing them were their employers. Well, the Pharisees were a strict group of religious leaders. And they were upset with this Rabbi Jesus, who was allowing the people they called sinners to hang out with them. But even worse, Jesus was eating with these spiritually unclean people, this godless group. But Jesus went over to these sinners with love and compassion. And he had something to say to his critics, the Pharisees. He tells them three stories that all have the same point. Verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a, has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now Jesus is giving a very common scenario here, something that they could picture. 100 sheep would be a fairly normal-sized flock. A count would be taken nightly to make sure they're all there. And so when the count comes up short, the shepherd realizes, I need to find the sheep. Now the open country, we're told, was a fairly safe place to leave the ship, sheep. And so the shepherd, caring for this one sheep, decides to leave the 99, trusting they'll be okay. And this was, of course, a bit of a risk. But that one sheep was very important. That was literally 1% of what they were worth, what their job was about. And so they went searching for this animal. And when they would find it, frightened, confused, often injured, they'd put it over their shoulders and then head back as fast as they could to the flock, to make sure they were okay. But the climax of the story is not the return of the sheep. It's the triumphant rejoicing when the sheep is finally found, saying, rejoice with me. You know, they're excited, like this is a big deal, finding the sheep. You know, the odds are fairly slim. What if it fell, got hurt? And sheep are known for being incredibly stupid and getting into trouble. So this is about rejoicing, And Jesus here is stressing both by parable and by direct statement that seeking and receiving sinners pleases God. That there is more rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents and turns to God than there is when 99 of these righteous type people think how good they are and talk about themselves. Well, Jesus decides to tell another story to make sure the self-righteous religious leaders get the idea. Verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. 
Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So now Jesus talks about this woman who's lost a valuable coin, a silver coin, and we know in the Greek it's the drachma, which was the equivalent of one day's labor or wait, or I'm sorry, one week's labor. And um, so uh, she, it's, it's significant. I'm sorry, a day's, day's labor. So let's guess in our, you know, it depends on how much you make per hour. Maybe $200, maybe $150 for some of you. It might be $300 for others. To us, honestly, that's not a huge amount of money. But most of us don't live on the edge that people in that time lived on. And so we're told she had 10, so it seems she's got 10. This is her her entire savings. She doesn't have money in the bank. She doesn't have investments. This is it. And she's lost one-tenth of what she owns. And so she searches. And back then, it probably would have been a dirt floor, not as easy ours. You know, you're checking tile or maybe carpet. But, you know, she's sweeping now, hoping to hear the clink of the coin, hoping to find whatever happened to it. And when she finds it, she comes and tells her neighbors, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And again, Jesus says, this is what it's like in heaven. Man, there is rejoicing when a sinner repents. Finally, he tells another story, very familiar to us, the prodigal son. After the son asked for his inheritance, the father didn't say, you know what, he always was the troublemaker, that younger one, you can never trust the younger one. I'm going to put my time and energy into his older brother and just forget about him. He took his money and left. Who cares? No, that was not the father's attitude. He was waiting, watching down the road, praying his son would come home to him. And when he did, he rejoiced and threw a party. And the older brother wasn't happy. Verse 32, Jesus says that the father told his other son, this brother, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. And is alive again, he was lost and is found. Now, in each case, something of value had been lost. And when it was found, there was rejoicing, there was happiness. When God says people are lost, it means they're out of a relationship with him. When Jesus spoke of Judas being lost, he said it would have been better for him to never have been born. People who are lost do not have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. They will not spend eternity with God in heaven, but will be forever separated from Him and all that is good. And God sees these people as lost. And that's why He initiated this all-out search to bring His property back, that they might be rightfully reclaimed. That search had two phases. The first part was Jesus coming, giving His life on the cross so that we could know God. But the second part was then the commission Jesus gave to his disciples. Disciples, anyone who follows Jesus should be all of us here. And he said, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, you go and do for others what I have done in your life. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit will be doing that tonight and teaching them to obey everything I've told you. That's our calling. That's what we are to do. So God has given us a role in bringing people to the Savior. You know, if I said to you on the way in here this morning, you know, I was pulling, my, pulling something out of my pocket, and I lost a quarter in the parking lot. I, I didn't see where it went. Like, hey, if any of you find it, like, feel free, it's yours. After church, there might be one or two kids who would go looking for it, right? But if I said to you, you know, I was walking in here, and I had a $100 bill rolled up in my pocket, and I dropped it somewhere between where my car is parked and, you know, the entrance here. And if, if you can find it, it's yours. I don't know what happened to it. Some of you right now would have a sudden coughing fit. Oh, i got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be back. And you'd be out there searching for it because it's valuable. It's worth something. If we value something that's lost, we will go looking for it. Who's going to go looking for God's property? Only those who place a premium on the things God cares about. Rick Mobley says, imagine a fire is burning your house, burns your house to the ground. You're the only one who escapes and everything is lost. And a neighbor comes and says to you like, oh man, I'm so glad you made it out. I'm sorry about your family. But I saw the fire when it started. It was on your roof. 
but I know you hate to be awakened. Like, you've always told me how important your sleep is, and I, I didn't want to do that to you. So, you know, I just, I prayed th th that you would be able to get out safely. And I'm, I'm glad you did. Now, would you be like, thank you for praying for me? Wow, I really appreciate that. Of course not. You'd be like, how could you not? Woken us up, how could you have done this? And yet, we do the same thing. Lost people are all around us heading for an eternity separated from God and we just don't care enough to tell them. We don't care enough to take that risk that they might reject us because of the message of Christ. Well, if we do not value people's souls, we won't go looking for them. If we don't go looking, then we can't fulfill our purpose, which is to bring people into a right relationship with God, help them to grow in their faith so that they in turn are reaching people for God. If we don't fulfill our purpose, what good are we for God? Again, the first core value of our church says God loves lost people and he wants us to reach them. Romans 10 says it this way, verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? They can't. How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Of course they can't believe they haven't heard of him. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now the problem is when we think of preach, preaching is what I do, Jeff does it, Christian, Glenn, now, we are all called to go preach the good news of Christ to those who do not know him. So let me ask you, are your feet lovely? This is how lovely are the feet of those who bring good news. Some of you, your toes are ugly, but you have beautiful feet because you're using them to touch others for Christ. Well, let me ask you this. Are you willing to accept the person even though you might disapprove of their sin. You know, the same way some Christians treat uh, unchurched people, it's a wonder that many come to Christ. Instead of showing gentle respect, so often we exude this uh, cruel contempt. They're not as good as us. They, they light a cigarette, we scowl. We don't like cigarettes. I don't like cigarettes. I'm allergic to them. But I, I want to reach lost people more than I want them to stop smoking. If they swear, we get offended. You know, thankfully as a pastor, I almost never hear the F word. I don't like it. I really hate the word. But man, if a lost person's talking to me and they're using it, I'm not going to be like, well, your, your speech is offensive to me. I'm going to be like, man, they need Jesus. He'll clean them up. I just need to bring them to the Savior. Here's the thing. We often act as if unchurched people should embrace the same biblical values that we have before they come to know Christ and have the Holy Spirit to change them. We're offended when sinners sin. Guess what? That's what sinners do. And that's why the Savior came. Look at how Jesus acted around people we'd consider sinners. You know, so often when we're like the Pharisees, like, oh, that's a really bad crowd Jesus is around. Now, I do want to say this. Maybe you're a newer Christian. Your faith is not that secure. You need to be careful who you're around if they can pull you down. But Jesus wasn't worried that, you know, the tax collectors and sinners are going to pull him down. He's going to pull them up. And so we need to care about them the way our Savior did. You ever notice Jesus seemed to genuinely like hanging out with these questionable types? You know who he did not like to hang out with? The self-righteous people. Pharisees. Again, these are the cream of the crop. They are the most spiritual religious Jews that there are. Jesus did not like them because it was all a show. It wasn't real in here. It was just making themselves look good. Well, in Discipleship Journal, Dick Staub writes this. Many years ago, I attended a birthday party for my gay friend and co-worker, Julian. Sixty gay men and four straight women had gathered to celebrate in a high-rise penthouse with a dramatic, sweeping view of the San Francisco Bay. Greeting me warmly, Julian exuberantly kissed me on both cheeks, something that had never happened at the office, I assure you. I took a deep breath and ventured into a scene that was well beyond my comfort zone. I chuckled quietly, asking myself a familiar question, what in the world am I doing here? But actually, I knew I was, why I was there. I had prayed with some friends about this party just a few hours earlier. 
As so often happens when I followed Jesus into the world, opportunities appeared. And because I listened to the party goers as they told me about their journeys, by 2 a.m., five of them were gathered with me in a corner talking about spiritual things. Jesus loved hanging out with sinners. Not because he wanted to be like them, because he wanted to reach them for God. Because they were lost and he wanted them found. Well, self-righteous people think they've got it all together. They don't need help. But God loves lost people and he's calling us to reach them. Here's the thing that drove Jesus to seek and save the lost. He wanted to see the broken healed. He wanted them to spend eternity with him in heaven. Compassion has to be at the heart of our effort to reach lost people. If you're doing this so that other Christians will be like, wow, boy, they're doing evangelism. That's a really spiritual person. It's not going to work. If you're doing this just out of guilt, like, okay, I know I got to do this. All right, I'll say a few words to them. It's not going to work. Our heart has to be in the right place or our efforts will fail. We can't just vomit out a quick testimony like, okay, Lord, is that enough? I'm out of here. No, we have to go into this like, Father, sh show me what you want me to say. Lord, give me a heart. You love this person. Sometimes the people, they are not very likable. Sinners sin, and some of them, their sin is ugly. Who they are is ugly. And yet, God loves them anyway. And we're called to love them too. People are valuable in the eyes of God. You know, he placed you in your family for a reason. He placed you at your job or school for a reason. He placed you in your neighborhood for a reason. You're to be his light. The people there are to see him through you. And the Holy Spirit, the very power of Christ, lives in you. The life that Jesus offers is available to others, and you can make a difference if you allow Jesus to do it in you and work through you. You know, when people run into you, they run into the Christ who is in you. You may not know all the answers that they have to their questions, but you know someone who does, Jesus. Well, not everyone who listened to Jesus accepted his message, and that's so important for us to realize. You know, we so often go into thinking like, man, I gotta do this, how am I gonna say this right? Man, I gotta think of something. This is ultimately God's job. You're just his vessel. So go into it saying, Lord, I want you to use me. Just give me your words, Lord. I want you to be glorified. We need to share the message, but we have to do it with love and with care. I've heard some Christians say, I don't talk about my faith. I show my faith. We absolutely should be showing our faith. It is wonderful that you show your faith, but you don't talk about your faith because you talk about that TV show you love. You talk about the football game you just watched. You know, you talk about your social media that you just posted. You talk about all kinds of things, but no, not Jesus. You know, I love him so much, I'm not going to talk about him. That's how much I love him. I'm going to be silent, and somehow they're going to guess. It's Jesus in me. They're just going to know. No, they're not just going to know. They need to hear the message. Again, show, we absolutely must show Jesus, but that's not enough. That's a cop-out is what it is. That's cowards. Saying, man, I know my parents said i got to ask someone a problem. I'm not going to do it. That's what we are when we do that. If you're a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a disciple, then you know that your job is to make disciples, who you will then teach to make disciples themselves as they reach people. So someday you're a spiritual grandparent because that person who got saved brought someone else to Christ. And then maybe you're a great-grandparent because that person who got saved reach that person who then reaches another person. That should be our goal. Now, I want to remove the fear factor because, again, I get it. Like, so often we even think about sharing with someone, you know, we start to sweat some, the palms get a little sweaty, the mind starts to lock up. When we think of sharing our faith with others, we often imagine going up to a stranger and handing them a track or knocking on someone's door and, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? Now, there are times for that, um, please not Saturday morning like the Jehovah's Witnesses hate it. But there are times. But the vast majority of evangelism should be happening in relationships with the people we know, with our family members, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, in places where it's safe to share. 
So we need to be building relationships. It's important to take that step and tell them about Jesus. So how do we lead people to Christ? Let me just share with you six things. First of all, number one, be humble and respectful. Only the Holy Spirit can lead your friend or family member or loved one to Christ. You can't badger them into the kingdom. Some of us just think if we just argue enough, and if we just point enough, then they're going to want Christ. It's not going to happen. Be humble. Nothing's worse than, no, I know the truth. You don't. Listen to me. Deb had a boss who would say, listen to me. She hated it. Listen to me, Deb. Deb, listen to me. They're not going to want to listen if that's how you act. Be humble. Be respectful. Listen to the Holy Spirit to, to have him show you what you should share because to be perfectly honest, sometimes there are Christians who do more damage as they're evangelizing than if they had said nothing because they turn people off to the gospel because of their attitude and how they do it. They're not doing it out of humility. They're not doing it out of love. They're pointing fingers. That's not going to work. Don't do it. Ask God to make you humble and respectful. Secondly, ask questions. This works because people love to express their opinions. Ask them, do you believe in God? Do you believe in heaven? Did you grow up going to church? Who do you think Jesus is? And you're not doing this just waiting, giving them like one sentence, then, well, nope, that's wrong, here's the truth. You're pulling them out. You're asking them questions. And what happens is when they share with you, that then opens up naturally opportunities for you to share with them. It makes them more open. So ask good questions. Third thing is link spiritual things to everyday life. Take a topic you're discussing and pull out the spiritual side of it. Often there is. Maybe you've watched a movie together, or even a stupid TV show. Often there are spiritual things in them. Not deliberately, but things you can pull out. Look for those opportunities and seize them when you find them. Number four, invite them to a service or an event. If all else fails, use this method. Actually, it's a great method in conjunction with your own sharing. Invite them to something. As you're sharing, let them see other Christians. Some of you knew Francois and Denise, and one of the most important things in our friends coming to Christ was that they got to know all of you. Because when we first met them, they didn't know other Christians. And to them, we were a bunch of judgmental, hypocritical people. And they started going, well, Mark and Deb are really nice. And then we'd have them over, and we had some of you over. And they were going like, I really like them. And pretty soon, they loved to throw parties. And they used to have parties with all these lost people. And pretty soon, it'd be like half church people. They weren't Christians, but just they liked Christians. So invite your friend. Let them see that we're not all crazy. Maybe half of us but not all of us. Well, the fifth thing is tell your story. At some point, you're going to need to share your story of what Christ did in your life. And again, this is where it gets scary. I always suggest to people, just think of three things to talk about. First of all, what was your life like before Christ? Pick something that your life was like before you knew him. I struggled with anxiety, or I was really fearful, or I was going through this. Those of us who got saved when we were younger, it makes it more difficult but um, we can talk about problems. Then talk about the Savior, how you came to him. What was it like when you received him? Talk them through that. And then finally, talk about the difference Jesus makes. So before Jesus, when you came to Jesus, and now the difference. Hey, now when I go through some of those things, I still have problems, but he walks with me through them. It's a great way to share. Sometimes your story is just going to be two minutes. You just need to give them a short version. Sometimes you're going to have an opportunity to give them the long version, but tell your story. And then sixth, share how they can receive Christ. I know some of you are thinking, like, I'm a new Christian. I've only been a Christian for two years. Mark, I've only been a Christian for 50 years. I don't know what to say. Well, let me show you a simple way to share the gospel. It's called the Bridge to Life Illustration originally put together by the Navigators. Um, with this, on one side, there's us. We are sinful. We're far from God. There's a chasm. So if you were doing this literally on a piece of paper, a napkin, whatever, you just put in first the chasms. So here and here, you're over here, we're over here, God's over there, and we can't get across. We can try good works. We go to church, pray a lot. None of them are going to be enough. We need a Savior. 
It says here, wages, sin is death. There's really three scriptures. If you just memorize three verses, there's a whole lot more. There's about 10 that they want you to memorize. But if you can memorize three, you'll know enough. Romans 3, 23, 11 words. Can you memorize 11 words? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so you tell them, we're over here because we've sinned. That's why there's a chasm. And we can't possibly get across it. Romans 6, 23. So the nice thing is this, Romans 3, 23. Okay, I've got that in my brain. Romans 6, 23, just double the number three. The rest of it's all the same. And then it says, it's longer, it's like 19 words. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what we have earned by our sin is spiritual, eternal death, but God made a way for us. He gave a gift, eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, and then you draw the little cross in there, and you show them how now we can get to God because Jesus has bridged that divide. And then if you just memorize John 3, 16, I mean, holding it up at football games is certainly effective, but it's better, those of you who are older know what I'm talking about, those of you who are younger, like, what? Um, but it says this, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, eternal, have eternal life. Those three verses are really enough to give them the core of what the gospel is about. But I want to remind you of this, this is not sales. Okay, your, jo- your job is not to get them across the finish line no matter what. Salesmen will lie They'll say, oh, no, sure, it'll be there by Monday. Don't worry. Nope, it gets there Thursday. They know it's going to get there Thursday, but they want the sale. No, our product's the best thing out there. It's flawless. You'll love it. Nope, you won't. It's got lots of problems. Don't lie about what this is all about. Man, there's a cost to following Jesus. Bonhoeffer called it the cost of discipleship. Following Jesus is going to mean laying down our lives. Jesus gives us everything but we in turn are to give him everything. And we're to follow him, again, making disciples who make disciples. So be honest about what's involved. You're asking them to lay down their life, giving it to the Savior so that he can give them his life and eternal life. Now, this is enough time for you to learn how to do this. So, Google Bridge to Life. And you're going to see lots and lots of different ways you can look at this. First of all, there's going to be multiple videos by pastors, Bible teachers, the Navigator leaders. Navigators first put this together. Um, and they're going to talk through how to do it in eight minutes. Here's how you walk through this entire thing. Here's another version of it, a lot more verses, a lot more involved in it. Um, I would encourage you, watch some of those videos. And then those three verses, it, it, there's a whole bunch here you're going to see. Uh, that's going to be overwhelming to many of you, and when your lost friend needs to hear about Jesus, you're like, I don't remember all those verses. Um, Boy, just three. Those would be enough to give them the basic truth. But Google that. Watch it really two hours, an hour to watch, review, review, and then probably an hour to memorize these verses. The first day, it's going to take more time. By the way, if you memorize something like this, you need to work on it the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and a month later, or it will be gone. So keep working on it. But man, God can use you if you're willing. It's time for us to stop with the excuses and start seeking lost people. You know, I don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism. It is in the Bible. It is a gift. Some people have it. Man, I've, I've seen people just, they can sit down with someone an hour later, the person's a Christian. And I covet that gift. Man, Lord, I wish I had that. I remember being embarrassed as a new pastor, like, man, I should have the gift. Don't know why I don't. I felt so much better when I read in Christianity Today magazine that one in 13 lead pastors say they have the gift of evangelism. All right, despite what all of you say, I'm normal, and I feel good about that. Well, just because I don't have the gift of evangelism doesn't mean I'm not called to evangelize. Just because this isn't easy for me doesn't mean that I am not to do it. And I want to tell you, you don't have any excuse either. The Bible is clear. Every Christian is to be a lighthouse. We're to point people to Jesus. All of us. Do you know Jesus? If so, you're to do it. Are you a new Christian? Great. You're still to do it. You don't have to know everything. Just let them know what you know. God loves lost people. He wants us to reach them. So start praying for your lost friends, your family members, your neighbors, your acquaintances. 
Begin to ask God each day, Lord, today give me an opportunity to speak to someone. Because if you'll pray that prayer every day and really mean it, Lord, today open my eyes, let me see. God's going to start giving you opportunities. They will be there if you'll look for them. Ask God for that heart of a shepherd who leaves the 99, my friends, my Christians, oh, I like being around Christians. And you know what? It's true, I do. I would much rather be around Christians than non-Christians. Christians are imperfect. They are. But I remember years ago when Deb and I joined a pool uh, that our boys went to. And as a pastor, and before that I was a seminary student, before that I was a Bible major. I've been around Christians since I was 18. I kind of I had some lost people, but man, the pool, lost people are horrible. Like they gossip like crazy. And guess what? There's no saying like, hey, that's not nice. We shouldn't be saying that. Why not? I want to. I'll do it. I love being around Christians, but man, we got to go past the church and look for that lost one as a shepherd would. Leave the 99 and go for them. Here's the thing. I bet if you had a neighbor who rang your doorbell and said, you know what, we're watching this sheep of my friends, and they showed you a picture. Now, first thing, if you're like me, you're going to think is that thing needs a bath. But if it had a bath, it would be the cutest little lamb ever. If they said, listen, I was watching for a friend, it got out. I don't know where it is, and there's that major road right over here. I'm really worried. Now, it's one thing if you're in the middle of something, but if you weren't doing really anything and you had some time, you'd be like, yeah, of course I'll go help you. Let me jump in my car. Let me go run around the neighborhood. And you'd be thinking, man, what if I could save that cute little lamb? We've got something so much more value. People's lives. Eternity is in the balance. Guess what? That lamb is going to be good for wool and then good for dinner. That's where that lamb is headed. It's true. Our lost friends have a destiny too. Which one do you want them to have? Now, again, it's not up to us. We can't do it. It's the Holy Spirit working in us. But man, do we love them enough to want to rescue them the way we'd want to rescue a cute little lamb? I think often not. Kind of like in movies. You ever notice in movies, I, just, uh, I was a physical therapist this week, and they were talking about a movie in which a dog died. And they were really offended. How could they do this? You know the sad thing? In a movie, a hundred people will be killed. We don't think a thing of it. A dog died. I love dogs. I love my dog. But man, people are of so much more value. Will you have the heart of a shepherd who will leave the 99 to seek the one? I don't know about you. I struggle with this. It's not easy. But God wants to use us. And let me tell you, we live in New Jersey. This is an incredibly dark area we live in. Man, God needs light, and we are to be it. Let's pray. Lord, I think if most of us were honest, we would confess that we don't have your heart for lost people. At times, we care about them, Lord. At times, we might even share with them. But Lord, our heart doesn't break for them the way your heart breaks for them. Lord, we don't hurt for them the way your heart hurts for them, knowing that they are headed for eternity without you. <clears throat> Lord, I would ask that we as a congregation, but more than that, we as individuals, would get serious about loving lost people the way you love them. Lord, help us to be faithful praying for our lost friends, families, acquaintances. Lord, help us to be faithful in saying to you, Father, today, use me. And if you want me to speak, Lord, I'm willing. Lead me. God, I would ask for a harvest of lost people. I would pray, Lord, that there would be people who'd come to know you through our ministry. As each of us goes into our community, our individual towns, our neighborhoods, and we shine the light that you have given us. Lord, we can't do this on your own. We need your Holy Spirit's power in us. We need you to guide us. We need you to direct our words. More than anything, Lord, we want you to be glorified in us. Lord, reach that one and use us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.